Friday afternoon, folks. We're back here in the Think Tech studios overlooking Waimanalo, Oahu. Actually, we're in Honolulu, and there's a facade going on behind us here. Ted Ralston here, our show Where the Drone Leads, the Think Tech Hawaii, with guests, first timer, Nevada. John, have you got, I mean, Nevada, have you got some other names on that too, or is it just Nevada? Just Nevada. Yeah, how about works. Utah or no. Southern California? Is, is that going there too? I did somewhere? have one admiral who used to call me every state but Nevada. But oh, but Nevada. Okay, but, Nevada. but we'll call you Nevada. We'll call Nevada. Okay, so you have Nevada here, and you're actually from Alaska. Yes. Nevada from Alaska. Okay. Exactly. And uh, Nevada is the director of the Pan Pacific Unmanned Air Systems Test range complex right which is a significant thing for us here in hawaii to, that we spent the last week working on and eric yamashita joining us right down the street from mdptc once again the world's most unpronounceable <laughs> acronym right next to pputrc and uh, in fact it's it's really good it's justice that you guys get together because you have these acronyms that nobody understands or can pronounce anyway eric is uh been on the show several times and is always leading the way in terms of uh, new technology in the world of disaster operations in the Pacific. And the two go together very well, UAS and disaster operations. And of course, that was part of the subject of our discussions this year, this week. Um, actually, uh, Nevada, we've had, I think, about six people from the state of Alaska right here at this table. We've had Roe Bailey, we've had Marty Rogers, uh, uh, Peter Wembley, and some others. So if you think of six people from Alaska being on one TV show, that's a significant part of the population of the state, right? All in, yes, all in one is, place. Yes, actually it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite a bit. Right? <laughs> and just so you know, right down the street, we have uh, right next to, in fact, in the same building as NDPTC, we have the uh, Ocean at, uh, Technology Company, and they have produced parts for the UASs that you guys are running up in the Arctic. Uh, parts that are coated with a, a hydrophobic coating so that ideally they won't collect any ice or any water. Uh, during uh, right. operations in wintertime up there. So we'll stop down and see them a little bit later on the way over to, to the water side. Anyway, we had this week that we we're all part of, and all, as well as a number of other people, the Aerospace Summit, which we've talked about on this show many times, which is a periodic gathering in Hawaii of the uh, program elements, program people, and ideas that are dealing with aerospace in Hawaii. And this subject here, UAS, is right in the middle of that aerospace domain, and it's also not in that aerospace domain. It's in the domain of search and rescue, it's in uh, environmental species protection, it's in beach erosion, it's in Department of Interior bridge and uh, railway studies up in, uh, up in Alaska and all. And uh, we've got to really figure out for Hawaii here how to take this aerospace originated function and expand it into these areas that are not traditional aerospace, filmmaking for example. And PPUTRC, or the Pan Pacific Unmanned Air Systems Test Range Complex, can be central to that. Yes. And so, John, I mean Nevada, sorry, I keep mispronouncing your name. <laughs> I shouldn't call you John. Uh, tell us a little bit about where PPUTRC came from, how it's seen by the FAA as an element of the future, and where you think it's going. Sure. Uh, PPUTRC started several years ago under the Alaska Center for Unmanned Aircraft Systems Integration. Another one of those long... Uh, unmanned... Ala uh, wait, Alaska? Alaska Unmanned, unmanned. Aircraft Integration Systems. Uh, a quasi. So now I have now you got me confused on it. But anyway, you are today? Alaska Center for Unmanned Aircraft Systems Integration. Okay. Quasi. All right. And we were part of the uh, test sites that were stood up by the FAA several years ago, and the Pan Pacific fell under the Aquasi uh, forum for that, uh, where Aquasi was handling Alaska, and the Pan Pacific, as part of the stand up with the FAA encompassed not only Alaska, but also the ranges in Oregon, as well as Hawaii, and later on, it, well, currently now, we also have the country of Iceland. So Iceland's the 51st state in this context? Just about, okay. right. Don't tell the Icelanders okay. that, they might get upset. But. Well, they have to get Obamacare if we yeah. make them the 51st state. <laughs> so we were stood up, and um, working through that, we were given, uh, to go from the FAA to go through and see how we, as the test sites, could promote UASs and do it in a way of being through policies and procedures and being a very professional driven organization so that we could promote that and help the FAA, help them with what the requirements would be down the road and what we can do and how they could develop and what the rulemaking would be. 
Um, it becomes a workshop for the FAA, in effect. In, in a sense, it does. Uh, you know, uh, we're literally on that pointy spear as, a, as a, one of the FAA for R&D had said, that we as the test sites are out there trying to learn how to do such things as beyond visual line of sight or do disaster, uh, first, uh, first responder disaster And in this test domain, failure is an option, I presume. Failure is a good thing to have because you know where the boundaries are. <laughs> Well, yeah. To a limited as, extent. As an old test, test and evaluation guy, I don't like to put things in the ground, you know. So that, that's where the, all the processes and procedures and the rigor of following test and evaluation comes into play, that we try to uh, encourage that and promote people how to do the UAS testing on our ranges in a way that uh, they become professionals and promotes them and their organizations to thereby uh, be certified to fly in, into the commercial aspect. So, and ranges in the context of Hawaii mean areas of land uh, or water or yes. both where testing could be done without interfering with other operations, without being over people and without uh, becoming a problem in some other operation that's already going on. You wouldn't want to be doing operations near an airport, for example. Right, exactly. Over a crowd or people or over a school or something like that. So we're talking about remote areas with challenging terrain. We have some serious challenging terrain here in the steep Koala Mountains and, and uh, the strong winds, turbulence, the leeward side, we have the downdraft. So there's a lot of performance challenges that are presented to unmanned air systems here. And, and, and that's uh, something that I've learned over the past week at the summit, uh, which was very uh, interesting to me coming in and hearing about Hawaii and uh, what it all entails, especially the downdrafts mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the volcanoes. We have volcanoes up in Alaska as well, but there's some differences between them as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was very, uh, very educational for me. So our challenge here in Hawaii is to figure out where those ranges or where those areas that could be considered ranges temporarily are and get them surveyed and get them part of the system and yes. then generate missions that can be tested in those ranges and then generate sponsorships, like three things in a row here, sponsorships to get com commercial companies to come in or agencies as the case may be and do testing. Yes, exactly. Feed the information back to the FAA after we're done, give them the good and the bad and tell them where things worked and didn't work. Right, and that's what the FAA is looking for is that research aspect of what they want to see back is what did you do, uh, what portion of the, their requirements or our requirements from the test sites were we trying to um, enhance and then what's the feedback in the data that we could give to the FAA in far as uh, lessons learned and uh, processing uh, into the future. Can't ask for a better wide open uh, canvas to paint the picture on. That's pretty cool. Yes, exactly. And Eric, over at NDPTC, this, you know, what Nevada's, I'm going to call you John, but I didn't, I caught myself. <laughs> what Nevada's talking about is a, is a very robust and um, challenging test range system that we could take ideas coming out of NDPTC or needs expressed by NDPTC partners or the Primo partners and package up tests that can be done in those ranges against the objectives that you would have from a disaster operations perspective. Yeah, so right now we're looking at um, damage assessment, uh, search and rescue. Okay, damage kind of assessment, search and rescue. And, yeah, and then other uses of sensors and technologies, uh, UAV technologies for, you know, right now there's a Hurricane Matthew that's going around in Florida and the East Coast and then people are saying, oh, uh, we want to find out what the damage is out there, right? And so we're since we haven't really tested our UAVs out in the actual uh, environment, it would be nice to test these things out in test sites and other places. So you could help uh, kind of come from a requirements perspective, what the requirements are for, let's pick damage assessment. Yeah. Damage assessment <coughs> in the response to a hurricane. Uh, damage assessment could be uh, could be the infrastructure damage and housing and, and structures and things. It could be uh, waterways, could be beaches, could be docks, could be pretty much anything. Yeah. Have you got a way to prioritize that or help us figure out what those targets of damage assessment might be? Well, right now we're working with some structural engineers and other partners to figure out all these things to how to integrate um, some of this into our training courses because we're about training, developing training courses for first responders. So it's best to collect a lot of this information and come up with best practices and 
what types of UAVs they should be purchasing and you know being used in this type of operation. That's a really important point. What types of UAVs should be purchased? What we see, at least in my experience, Nevada, is that we have a world that's uh, that's driven by the manufacturers. They're saying, yes. "Use this thing I brought you. It's going to take care of you." But what we heard from our local power company is here. There's a one-year uh, Stardust in your eyes phase. You bought the UAV, now you have Stardust in your eyes figuring out for a year, I'm going to use this thing, but it takes a year to figure out, no, I can't use it. It's not in my mission, it's not in my training, I don't have the liability protection, and it doesn't do the job. So what did I do wrong? Well, I bought what the guy sold me. And maybe a better way to do it is to figure out what my requirements are as a power company or disaster operations guy, and then get PPUTRC to go start pushing on the testing and, and find out what, what what's going to work in those, against those requirements. So Eric, how do we pull those requirements out of, besides the term damage assessment, how do we get down to the specifics? We talking about uh, uh, three uh, RGB uh, imagery of buildings and then three-dimensional uh, rendering of the straightness versus the non-straightness of damaged members or something? Are we talking structural? Are we talking electrical power? Are we talking, well, I mean, landforms? And we're talking about all, <laughs> All things. Don't I mean, want to put any pressure a, on you. No, it's just a matter of, we, you know, right now we, we have a damage assessment course, but it was primarily land-based, everybody carrying a, a camera. And so now we're looking at converting it to integrate UAVs and see how we can best uh, capture the same type of information from the UAVs. So, um, like I said, we're working with several subject matter experts in this area that they do land-based assessments and see if they can, we can compare that with uh, imagery and other things we ca capture with the UAVs. You know, one of the things we discussed at the, at the summit was typical, summits generally produce five-year plans and things like that that end up going on a shelf. One of the objectives, objectives we took away was have something we can do the next day. And I think this is exactly what we could do the next day, is sit down with Eric and a few others at, at, right down the street here and begin doing a, a, a mind meld. What is, what's going to be, what would work well? And you guys would have, you've got a lot of experience in that up in Alaska. Well, not just in Alaska, but Oregon as well. Oregon too. They were, they were starting to do some of the um, uh, um, power line mm -hmm. inspections, de-energized power line inspections. And then, of course, with the, if we talk about first responders, if that's what you were alluding to, with the two incidents I gave you about, you know, being asked by the, Fire, uh, Fairbanks Police Department to help in two searches. But uh, yes, yeah, so, you know, and working with the power systems. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, y you know, I think, I think the key that you talked about was getting the requirements down. Yeah. And I think that's always the first step yeah. and get everybody's requirements down. So do you think down. we could, on the next day, so to speak, that's a little bit, uh, uh, you know, a little bit wider than a day, maybe next week, have a telecon or something with the uh, with the Oregon guys and with your guys and with Eric and, and start coming up with how to pool our... Yeah, I think that, yeah. That, that's doable. Yeah. We, I think it is. Let's, uh, let's figure out how we're going to develop that after we uh, take our first break here and okay. come back and talk about how we're going to do that. Sure. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. My name is Ray Tsuchiyama. I was raised in Kalihi Palama, a proud graduate of Fireton High School. And I want to say that ThinkTech is a great program, brings people together, and creates a really great community of concerned citizens for the future of Hawaii. Aloha and welcome to the Savvy Chick Show on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm the weekly host at 11 a.m. Honolulu time. Very excited for the next six weeks we have the Aspire series, which is all about the coolest careers I could find and interviewing and getting insights from these amazing people who want to share it with you and help you live your dreams. Look forward to seeing you on the show. Aloha! Aloha, I'm Carl Campagna. I hope you please visit us this summer. It's a wonderful summer. It's actually a cooler summer than we're used to. But I hope that you come back and visit us and watch our show, Education, Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, here on Think Tech Hawaii. It's at noon every Wednesday. See you then. We're back, folks, for the second half of our show, Where the Drone Leads, and it leads to increased business in our area, our area being Hawaii, Alaska, and Oregon, through the Pan Pacific Unmanned Air Systems Test Range, range complex range. and supporting that is the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center and I think with that having pronounced both those terms you've just about shot the 15 minute second part of our, <laughs> of our show here. We're talking to Nevada from who's a, the uh, director at uh, PPUTRC out of University Alaska Fairbanks yes. 
and Eric Yamashita from NDPTC right down the street. And we were talking before the break on how we could start thinking about pulling together a real no kidding set of requirements. It may, you know, they may not be prioritized, but they're a start. And if we could start take those requirements and start running them against testing, and then see which ones can be accomplished, which ones can't, and think in the stressed areas beyond what the FAA allows today. We're talking beyond line of sight. We're talking cluster operations with multiple vehicles. We're talking uh, higher levels of autonomy in the command and control structure. That would be a superb product out of our interactivity today. And let me take us, you know, I'm this, there's no monologues a lot on this show, except for the host. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to uh, inject something into that thought process. Uh, this is a, 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 a drone racer drone, and this is a pair of goggles that's used to fly the drone racing. And it so happens that in Hawaii in two weeks, we'll have 200 of the world's best drone racing pilots come into the game here. And they operate whole, totally different from the rest of us. They operate in this uh, out of the goggles, and they see multiple streams of information coming in in 1 or 2D, and they, they compute it in 3D in their brains, and they operate. They operate incredibly close to uh, objects, and of course they can't hit them. You wouldn't, serve their, you wouldn't serve the purpose of making a circuit around the course. We found out that the performance margins of these kind of e pieces of equipment are so high, they have such a high rate of climb and such a high uh, turn, turn radius, uh, tight turn radius, they're extremely useful in search and rescue here in, in the very steep terrain we have. Because you can fly, we had a video clip on in a prior show, you can fly within 10 or 15 feet of the surface all the way up to the 2,000 foot top of the mountain and you're still only 30 feet AGL, you know, you're, you're uh, 2,000 feet MSL but within the AGL requirements, no problem, turn around and go down the other side. So you can get by with very cheap optics because you're so close. And if you look at vertical terrain, it's hard to get a good picture of vertical terrain and search and rescue from an overflying aircraft. But if you're on the surface, it's a whole different game. So one of the things we're going to do in this competition coming up is inject a search and rescue challenge or task or test card and have the racers break off. You got half an hour to start thinking how we're going to find this lost hiker and go after mm -hmm. them. So there's this thing that goes through my mind is this technology transfer from things like racing into our normal conventional world. And I'd like to inject that into our thoughts as part of, this, part of the solution space in this task we've just assigned ourselves to work with Eric and come up with a a set of requirements that might roughly constitute what it means to do damage assessment post-disaster. So what kind of people can we bring into that picture, Eric, and how do we get them? Well, I, I think we need to... Again, don't feel any pressure, you know. Yeah, I, you know. I, I think uh, as during that summit, we heard from uh, several people like uh, uh, George, right, in Purdy. He's, George Purdy yeah, on he's the line. a first yeah. responder, and, but he's also involved in other things at uh, UAVs and drones. Let's, let's do a shout out right here to George Purdy. That guy Absolutely. is, he, he, I think his IQ must be about 180. Don't, don't try and challenge him in anything. Yeah. He's got it. But, you know, coming, He's from also the, watching. coming from the first responder community, I think it's good to get some of these first responders in the, in the, um, in the picture and get them involved in the discussion. And then also bring in some engineers, structural engineers or uh, other types of engineers. And then also the maybe some of the UAV uh, manufacturers and others to see what kind of sensors and you know so so that we can kind of come up with an idea of what what's the technology that we need for this uh, to assess. The That's interesting. Uh, bringing in a manufacturer, um, I know a lot of the manufacturer people, and and you bring them in, and I worked at Boeing. Okay, mm -hmm. if you want a fighter, what kind of fifteen did you want? I mean, it, <laughs> that's how it works, and. Uh, uh, so we probably wanted, I would suggest we do ourselves first as, yeah. and, as users and then come up with that list and then have that dialogue with the manufacturers. But in terms of uh, 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 structures people and such, I, I, this is an interesting point. I, I wonder how George would think about uh, what he would characterize damage assessment as. A damage assessment for the sake of rebuilding the place, damage assessment for the sake of deciding where you're going to rebuild it or damage assessment from the perspective of doing an entry and you want to make sure the stuff's not going to fall down on you when you go in. Because mm -hmm. damage assessment probably has a bunch of different things in the minds of different people when they hear that term. Yeah. I, th I think when the last uh, item you brought up about uh, structure collapsing, that, that kind of falls in line with the search and rescue as well. Because mm -hmm. uh, with our partners at Teeks, uh, they, they, they 
I think they deal directly with search and rescue, and then we were trying to look at how, how can we partner with them as well, you know, using Good. UAVs. And okay, so we'll bring there. We don't have to reinvent that wheel. Use yeah. it. In fact, that goes to the point you made, Nevada, over and over again. Don't reinvent the wheel. Exactly. If it exists somewhere else, let's bring it in. So that's the beauty of going to Oregon and bringing their point of view on this mm -hmm. uh, uh, disaster operations, UAS uh, capability and function. Um, also, you know, the Department of Emergency Management here, Mel Kaku and those guys, they'd like to be, they'd like to be included in these, mm -hmm. in these discussions, and they should be. Um, and so that's all uh, something we should maybe, yeah. maybe get you. When are you leaving, John? Nevada? Uh -huh. I'm leaving. But John's um, leaving when, and Nevada <laughs> leaving when. <laughs> well, both of us are going to be on a <laughs> flight on flight. Monday. <laughs> Monday. Yeah. Well, so we can't get you next week to uh, extend this thing any longer. What time are you leaving on Monday? Eight o'clock. Oh, shoot. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I think uh, we obviously have to include you in this conversation. That would, uh, for for obvious and, and logical reasons. But um, uh, we could really put a sort of a prototype total overall program here. What's the real user's end state needs? How does he measure ne success? And then how do we fulfill that? What do we find the gaps and fill that gap with technology? And I, and I think that's part of what you were going to is to find out, you know, exactly who we need to bring into this too, because, you know, having done a little bit of this up at Fairbanks with the police department and, uh, you know, and the fire department, on search and rescue and then who you're going to bring in from you know locally mm -hmm. what they're looking for and the engineer side for the stability of the building so it, i think it, the first step is really kind of getting the, our list together which mm -hmm. we, yeah, could, yeah. we could do that and then from there start looking mm -hmm. at what the requirements are and then building from there and going through and you know going back to george he, he used a term in the presentation he gave at the panel called uh, the search and rescue space he wanted to characterize the search and rescue space and i thought well that's a pretty cool definition because it doesn't just say give me a simple parameter of some kind but characterize the space and the thing that's intriguing about that is the space can be characterized by what you measure and it can be characterized by what history had what that space used to look like what it looks like today and you could even put simulation in there and you could put uh, virtual reality terms and such in there in, in uh, for example uh, uh, there's certain piles of debris a human can climb over, and there are certain piles you can't. So you could determine immediately uh, where there's lines of access and where there's not based on, uh, by, on analysis. So uh, uh, if you get the actual operators involved, as you said, I think you get a completely enhanced picture, certainly an enhanced picture, and maybe a different picture from what you as a, as a desk analyst might have, might have thought. And right. I look at myself as a desk analyst, and then my ideas get shattered by the reality of the real operators. Well, even getting the operators in there as well at the bottom yeah. level is, is key to that as well because you want to have the knowledge of what the pilots can do and what their aircraft can do with, mm -hmm. you know, oblique sensing and mm -hmm. looking, what you're talking about, determining height and what the sensors could do. So there's a lot of that as far as yeah. the requirements go, which would build up to what we would build on our test case. And, you know, and I th to the point you were just making that we kind of made together here, the operational style of that organization may have a lot to do with what the factors are that are important. The example I'm thinking of, as just you mentioned, it triggered my thought. We had a fire in uh, Mililani uh, two or three years ago. It took some UAS up to support the fire department, put infrared on them, thinking that they'd want to find the hot spots because the fire was burning low, not big flames, but stuff was going under the desert, under the forest peak and popping up. No, they didn't want that. They wanted smoke means you've got to pull the sensor off, put RGB on, and go look at the, where the smoke is. The reason is because the helicopter that drops off two guys with firefighting equipment looks for smoke. And so they wanted the UAS to do the same thing that the manned helicopter does. And that fits well with the training and with the doctrine and such. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the technology you think might do the job, in fact, may, but it doesn't fit the operational flow that's going on, and therefore it's not useful. And, and that's also why it's important after an operation like that is to have a hot wash and find out what you know, really was good and what we could do better on mm -hmm. and to get everybody involved and then even, you know, just follow on to that. And that helps build your aircraft up, helps with the uh, pilot training and what they're looking for, as well as the engineer side yeah. of it. Yeah. And that means, Eric, we, we start turning NDPTC into a action generator and a, and a, uh, a integrator and a 
tester of concepts as much as a developer of training material. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as you mentioned, Oceanit, we kind of work closely with them too. And, you know, as they're building components and testing stuff as well, we kind of talk to them and see what can fit with our training, how we can, you know, come up with the ideas together and things like that. And as well with, with you and Nevada, maybe, and others. And I think we're starting to assign Eric to, uh, <laughs> to uh, some, some uh, uh, patrols out here, uh, police patrols, fire patrols and such, and uh, uh, come back with the reality of uh, what it's like under the helmet and uh, in the gloves. You'd love that, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I bet you wouldn't mind doing some tour of tour duty up in Alaska. No, right? I wouldn't mind that. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. There's there's a, you, you got, got a volunteer, volunteer right exactly. here. Exactly. Right, yeah. Okay. So that's great. So uh, I, I think this, I love outcomes out of this program. We can actually do something instead of just bobbleheads that are talking. And uh, uh, that's me. I don't mean you guys. I mean, I appreciate you coming on the show. That's, this, this show is marked by the people who come on it. That's how it works. So that's, that's uh, great that you're here. So we'll take this for real. We'll take uh, what Eric's uh, new direction is. We'll help him move forward and we'll offer him PPUTRC as a place to start working out some of the kinks and the bugs and also feed information back to the FAA in the process. Exactly. And this is the leadership function that the FAA is looking for. And it's, it's great to fulfill that. And by the way, uh, we should do a hail out to the FAA. They've done a great job in the last year or two. I mean, people complained for a long time, then suddenly 333s hit. And then suddenly 107 hit. And suddenly we have the waivers on 107. And we're going to have the something else by the end of the year. I don't know what it is. But it, it's moving so fast now, we can't track it anymore. And uh, so. anyway, um, Nevada, thanks for coming on the show Thank first you for time. Thank you having me on the and show. And you're, you're the, I think, again, you've completed, we probably have had 100% of the Alaska population on the show by now. <laughs> Eric, the frequent flyer on the show, appreciate that. And we got an assignment for you. And I think a way to go forward here that's going to be useful. And we can take this, take this into our discussion about Primo. Primo, just so you know, is the Pacific Rim orientation of resilience thinking people and it happens in March every year and why don't we invite you guys are on the Pacific Rim last I looked at the map yes so we ought to be here primo and we're gonna pull all these kind of requirements together based on the training we do to ourselves right here in Eric's near-term need here in Hawaii we'll expand that to the Pacific and get those requirements from everybody and with that oh thank you very much for coming on once one more time Nevada. All right. thanks thank Eric you. and uh, we'll see you all next Friday folks and we have Senator Will Espero on and uh, Peter Quigley, and we'll be doing a hot wash on the summit. Good. Thanks very much. <laughs>